Why? What are you guys drinking today? I got this glass in Atlanta because that's where Coca-Cola is based. And that is where Macna is going to be this year. So this is technically a Macna glass from many years ago. <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping some of you will be able to attend this year and have a really good time and get educated. Hi, Manny. Hi, Lynn. Hello, Martin. Martin, you're not first. <laughs> hey, Rick. Hi, Pickle Boy. So uh, today's topic is going to be about uh, talking about the next thing we're going to add to our aquarium. And I figured that's a really good topic as we start the new year. And let's kind of go into some good goals right now before we make more mistakes. <laughs> because, you know, this is all about starting with new resolutions and new starts and, and approaching things with a fresh attempt. And so often what we end up doing is we just repeat the same mistakes over and over. So I thought, ah, let's be proactive. Let's try something different. So today we're going to talk about what you're going to add to your tank next. Man, so many of you have showed up. They're all saying hi. <laughs> Somebody said they're already having Crown Royal. Someone's having Pepsi Max. Yeah, so this is actually a Coca-Cola glass that I got in the restaurant um, that had everything Coca-Cola paraphernalia when I was at Magna last time. And uh, I was like, it's hot in here. I need a Coke. <laughs> so no coffee for me today. Um, I want... Dennis, I cannot believe that earthquake video you posted in Club Miller's Reef. He showed his tank and his Christmas tree just shaking. So hopefully you can get everything secured in a way to where you don't have to worry about the tank and you'll be okay. Um, it definitely is a valid concern and you should definitely prepare the floor, the supports, um, some kind of a, a securing system to tie the stand to the wall behind it. Those are some good approaches. So keep that in mind or do some research on that before the next earthquake hits. Uh, I need to... I've gone already ahead without even saying Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> so it is 2021 at last. I think we've all been waiting for this to happen. We just want to act like 2020 never happened. And, uh, oh, I don't know. There's good things on the horizon. And let's just hope that the vaccines that are starting to trickle out are going to make a difference. And uh, we can get back to our normalcy of life because it has not been pleasant, as you all know. And uh, it, it's hard because... You just have to ask yourself, well, do I want to just hibernate in my home? Do I want to go out and take a risk? You know, there's all that going on. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, let me set up something here on my computer so I don't get any interruptions. And, uh, okay, so let's just get into it. When you're looking at your tank right now, I want you to think about what's the next thing you want. What is the next thing you want to buy? And that would be anything. That could be equipment, that could be salt mix, that could be a new fish, or a new coral, or a new invertebrate. There are so many things that we just want. <laughs> and usually what happens is we run into a store and like, oh, that's pretty, I'll take it. And we don't really have enough knowledge when we take it. And coming home with that thing, we're like, okay, well, I'm going to do my best. Which, is it really your best if you did no homework on it? And running to, you know, different groups on Facebook or asking people, you know, hey, what do you think is a terrible way to research um, what you really need, the, the proper knowledge. So I would encourage you, if you were thinking, I really want this fish, for example. Let's say, for example, Caitlin was telling me, could we ever get an Achilles tang? And my gut reaction is instantly like, no. <laughs> but with some research, we can do some digging and really see who are the big offenders that don't get along with Achilles tang before we make that purchase. They're not inexpensive. They're not easy to make, to keep. A lot of people buy them and they die. So I want to make sure I'm, you know, giving you the best chance for success by doing the homework first. Now I'm sure there'll be an article about it in Coral Magazine. I'm sure there's articles and publications and different books I own as well. So I want to do some reading. I want to find out more about it. Uh, I've got a friend who has had one for many years that's fat and healthy and he, he always says, no one can believe I have this fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, because it's not an easy fish. I remember when I was at the Georgia Aquarium, man, it's all about Macna today. When I was at the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta um, a few years ago, the main person for the 800,000 gallon tank, her job was to you know, keep the livestock healthy. And she said to the her boss, I want to have a whole bunch of Achilles tanks. And the boss, you know, he's like, no way, we're not doing that because they don't want to throw away money. And she says, no, I'm... 100% certain I can do this. I have a method that works. 
And I was just thinking, well, you know, that's a, a nice approach. It's not just, oh, well, I really like the look of this fish or look really good in this tank. She said, I know how I'm going to do this. I know how I'm going to feed them. I know how I'm going to keep them healthy. So that would be the person I'd like to talk to about my fish desire <laughs> because she knew what she was talking about when she went to her boss to ask permission. And uh, I haven't been back to Atlanta, Georgia in many years. I don't know if they ever got them, but uh, I remember that story and I thought that it just, it resonated really well with me because it was the opposite of an impulse purchase. Now, if it comes to an equipment choice you're wanting to buy, of course, you know, the first thing you should always do is read all the reviews. And that's a really important one because we want to know as much as we possibly can about a product before we spend the money because once you open it, you're kind of committed. I mean, yes, you could ship it back or you could haul it back to the store or you could, uh, uh, I don't know what else you could do with it, <laughs> throw it away. But I mean, why buy something that you think will be okay if you just did a little more reading about it before you pull the trigger? And I mean, I do that all the time. I find things like, oh my God, add to cart, but I don't pull out the credit card. It's sitting in my cart. Then I go and do more reading and then I read more reviews and I read more comments. I'm like, oh, never mind. I, I can't remember what it was, but there was something I looked at recently that sounded pretty cool. <clears throat> but the, uh, all the comments were really bad. <laughs> and then, um, oh yeah, Caitlin wanted something for Christmas, I think it was, and her mom ordered it for her weeks ago. It still hasn't shown up. And when she went to the website to look up, you know, like any kind of what shipper are they using, what's going on, everything was bad about this product. The website looked good. It looked very professional, but when you looked at it really closely, you saw a lot of typos. It was clearly a translated website. <clears throat> and when it took her to the Facebook page, every single person on the Facebook page said, I never got my product. I can't get a hold of anyone. They don't answer emails. I mean, it was bad. And I just said, you know, if your mom can do it, she should just contact her credit card and just cancel that order immediately. And don't even wait till it finally gets here. Just stop. Just buy something else and uh, get your money back. So if we dig harder first, <clears throat> the odds are better that you're going to have a successful purchase that you're going to be happy with. <clears throat> the uh, choice of like getting inverts can be a little tricky <clears throat> because there are, so, there, number one, there's so many. <laughs> I, I don't even know the total count of inverts available in, in our hobby, but I feel like it's in the hundreds. And we need to also not only find out if our tank is compatible, is our water in good enough quality to maintain that animal, keep it healthy, and will it get along with the current animals we have in our tank? And so, again, I'm going to reiterate research being so important because if you just go out and buy something willy-nilly, and you don't have perfect parameters, if you don't have a, a suitable tank, that livestock could perish. And we don't want to do that. I, I read a lot of your comments on YouTube, and a lot of people say, you know, this channel has really helped me. So I realize I'm telling you, don't buy anything until you know more. That's the best advice I can possibly give you on this channel, because I want you to look at your tank, and I want you to be happy, and I want you to feel there's a success rate. I want you to feel like you didn't waste your money, I don't want you to feel painted in the corner. You know, I want things to go well. The, uh, the My own reef has been kind of driving me a little bit crazy for the last couple of months, and it's probably me not paying as much attention to it as I should. Um, I've always said my reef lives in spite of me, but uh, it's been just a little bit uh, unhappy, and I have been chasing alkalinity. It's just been a battle. So I'm at the point now where I'm uh, measuring it, well, I've been measuring it several times a week, and uh, I, my trident was offline for a while because I just ignored it. <laughs> and now I need to go deal with it and get it operational again, which would be nice. But I just need to get everything uh, straightened out before I add any other livestock because I don't want a new coral to come in and be unhappy. Now, phosphate has always been a problem because I feed the heck out of my tank. I'm just the worst. I, I want everyone to be fat and happy, and I put in so much food. And phosphates are crazy high. Um, again, and when I say high, you guys always think, oh, it must be like 0.1. We're like, no, 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 no. We're way, way higher beyond that. Now, uh, when I measured it um, a week ago, it was 0.75. And that's not weird. That happens in my tank a lot. But uh, I was like, okay, I got to bring it down. So I pulled out Phosphate Direct like I always do. And uh, mathematically, you're supposed to use so much, you know, so many drops to knock it down 0.5. And instead, what I did was I just did 150 drops, and which was not a full dose. And then, and I put in a five micron sock in my uh, modular sock holder. And then 
the next night I pulled that sock out and put a new sock in and did another 150 drops. And now for the past two days, my phosphates are measuring 0 0.05. So I'm very happy with that super low number. It will definitely help because I've been getting some nuisance algae in the anemone cube. But that one is one I got under control. Um, alkalinity is close. I mean, it's, it's hovering at 8.5. I'd like it to be more like 9. And so I'm trying to button that up a little bit better. And uh, nitrates are crazy high again. They're back up to around 60 or 80. So I've got 150 gallons of water behind the tank that I want to change this evening. And that'll put a dent in it. And then I got to make a huge vat of water, which is going to take three days to fill up and do another water change and another water change. And because I want to bring the nitrates much further down before I add anything new to the tank. I'm lucky that the livestock that lives in my water is used to it. And so it can tolerate it. But when you introduce a new thing, uh, very often you'll lose it because the water is so out of whack compared to where it came from. Not to mention that animal was already a little stressed from transport, handling, bagging, shipping, all that stuff that happens. Maybe it doesn't get enough food, you know, who knows, and then you put it into your tank with bad parameters and the livestock has a worse opportunity of surviving. So I'm telling you, my tank's not perfect either. And, you know, it, it's all about the husbandry. So if you stay on top of what's going with your tank, and if you're testing every week, like I tell you on Saturdays, you at least know where the numbers are. You can address the situation and you can work on it to get it under control. And by doing so, then when you want to get something new and you've done a little homework, you can put it in with a much greater margin of success. And that's how we should be when we're wanting to buy something new all the time. And I know, I get it. You know, there's times where I get impulsive too. And I just like, oh, got to have that. But I want to make sure that it's okay. Now, one of the impulse purchases that we made about, I'd say a month ago, we uh, went to Dallas North Aquarium, which is a store in North Dallas. And they had, and I brought them a bunch of my fungios from my tank and they gave me store credit. So I thought, oh, I have all this free money. Let me go ahead and buy something. And so, you know, I looked at everything and I found this adorable snowflake eel. I mean, the thing is maybe four inches long. It is just a little thing. Uh, maybe the diameter of a pencil, really small. And I said, the anemone cube is the perfect spot for it. So I put it in and pff, never saw it again. Fast forward about three weeks or so, and we're feeding Archie, which is our uh, tarantula. And Archie's glass aquarium cage is right next to the anemone cube. And as we're watching Archie eat a cricket, Caitlin's eye goes to the fungia coral that's right on the sand, and she saw this little head poke out. And she's like, you got to be kidding me. The snowflake eel is alive because, like I said, we hadn't seen it in three weeks and we were looking. We were looking under the rock with flashlights. We were going from every angle and it was nowhere to be found. Well, it turns out it's been living under that fungia and it was the coolest thing. And if I had known, I would have filmed this. I mean, we're just kind of like staring and we're in disbelief and we're so happy that this animal is alive, right? It was just like such a huge, oh my God, are you kidding me? That's fantastic news. But uh, what happened was we saw there's a fungia that I got that's a certain shape, kind of looks more like a tongue coral, but it's not. And then there's the regular kind of fungia that my tank grows all the time. So they were butting against each other. And what you could see was where the one and the other touched each other, there was a little bit of movement in the sand. And as we looked, we could see the stripes of the snowflake eel passing under the one fungia to the other. You just saw the stripes kept moving. And then it was like shaking. We're like, what is it doing? Why is it shaking? It's so weird. And so we just kept staring and watching and wondering what's happening. And then <laughs> as we were watching, suddenly this bristle worm came out from under the fungi on the other end. You know, so, you know, the two corals are together and it came out into the clearing and it was all twisted up and unhappy and, and you know, like, what the heck? And then you saw the eel's head come out, grab that bristle worm and yank it back under like, you're mine. And then we could watch the body of the eel spinning in the sand. It was doing the death roll like an alligator does. That uh, little snowflake eel has been eating bristle worms for survival, apparently, because it's not coming out to eat any of the foods I've been putting in. And I've been putting in pellet. I've been putting in the, uh, the fresh food from Elos. I've been putting in all my frozen stuff I always put. You know, there was an abundance of food, but the eel never came swimming out in the open to, like, get a bite. So that's why we thought it was gone. It didn't make it. It went into the plumbing. We didn't know where it went. We just knew it wasn't on the floor. <laughs> so I have been watching very, very closely that fungia for the last couple of days, and I have seen the head poke out a quarter of an inch and then go back under. It's so adorable. If I can ever get a decent picture of it, I will share it with the world. <laughs> but uh, for now, you just have to trust the story is true. Um, 
and and we were super i mean it just made our night just to see that it was alive and well that told us our our gobies are fine the eel is fine the new snail we got was fine you know these are all new things we picked up and here they are happy and healthy and doing well i mean that's what we all ask for that's what we want we want everything to be happy so that was a really really cool moment for us and it was an impulse buy which is the opposite of what this stream started to talk about but uh so like i said i'm human like you I, I have weaknesses and i'm like oh i gotta have it and i really should have held off but uh, i have had eels in the past so it wasn't like a mystery but uh, if you've never done something like you know if you've never had it before please 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 do the reading uh, one of the things i always recommend that you can do is you can say hey i want to put a deposit on this or even buy it but please don't bag it up you know mark it not for sale and let me go home and do my research and if i come back and i know everything you know and it looks like i'm good to go I will go ahead and pick it up tomorrow. And uh, if it's uh, if it's iffy, then could you just refund me tomorrow? You know, and see what they say. Uh, I've done that with stores, and they've always said yes. Now, your store may not be so kind, um, but they definitely don't want you to buy it, put it in your tank, things go wrong, and you try to return it. That they don't do. They almost never will take something back. But if you say, I want to do more reading, and I'll be back in a few hours or the next day, or... Um, <laughs> you know, whatever, then maybe they'll do that for you, especially if you've built up a good relationship with that store. So it's one of the perks of supporting your local uh, your local economy is that you build a relationship where they're willing to work with you when you, I mean, come on, you're saying, I want to learn more about this before I buy it. That is a wonderful approach. And hopefully the people running the store understand that mentality and, and support you as well. But, you know, there's no guarantees. You just have to see what works in your specific circumstances. The, um, I think that's really it on that one. It, this wasn't a big, long, deep topic. It was more like a preventative, <laughs> let me help save the reefs by getting you to slow down just a little bit for the brand new year before you go out and go shopping again with all your money left over from Christmas because maybe you got uh, gift cards and stuff, you're ready to go blow them. Just hang in there, you can do this. You can hang in there a little bit longer. You went this far without it. Um, and then again, like I said, with equipment, you can definitely do the research and read all the reviews and see how it, you know, how many stars it has. Is it doing well? And uh, that way you can get your answers and, and decide if you want to make that purchase or save up for something a little bit more expensive that uh, seems to be doing much better overall and has a greater amount of good reviews. All right. Um, I want to remind you that when we do our question and answer here part, and I've got a couple things to tell you about, and then we're going to go into the Q&A. And when you're asking your questions, please put at Milo's Reef and realize that when you ask me a question, I may not see it for about 10, 15, even 20 minutes because I'm answering the questions. And, it, you know, your question comes in quickly, and then I spend five minutes answering it. And then the next question is like pending. And see what I mean? It, it just You guys are way ahead of me. So be patient, tune in, and hopefully I'll get to your question. <laughs> um, let's see. First question is I'm reading all these comments because they're interesting. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, McGrath, he's not really asking a question, he's more telling us I'm in the process of starting up my new tank. I currently have my clownfish in and a Yasha Gobi with a pistol shrimp. Yes. I'm thinking about buying a four channel dosing pump before I move the corals over. Uh, that would be nice. And it sounds like you already have a different tank that's been doing well. And so you're having some way to automate the dosing will be very important, but you have to also stay on top of it. So whatever you choose to buy, make sure you calibrate it. Make sure you verify how much fluid is in the reservoir that it's drawing from, whether it's a bottle or a jug or an acrylic container. And, uh, Make sure that the tubing are clogged to where they're not actually putting liquid into your system. Uh, there's a few things you have to do. And you probably know some of this, but it's good to be reminded. We want to make sure everything's working. And once you plug it all in and you're super happy and you've got it all set up correctly, do not forget about it. <laughs> That's the best advice I can give you on that one. Cuball says, is quarter inch rigid tubing enough for drawing an air into a skimmer? Yeah, that should work. Some people like to use 3 8 Some like to go even larger. And then, like, for example, if they ran a large pipe through the attic, for example, to the outside, and then they connect a quarter inch for the last piece, you know, because it's not so obtrusive and, and, you know, less visible, you could do that. Um, that way there's like a larger body of air in the tube, and then you're sucking in the smaller amount rather than trying to pull from all the way outside. So you might consider that. Um, I think when I did it, 
because I did it with my 280 gallon tank uh, years ago. I, and mine had two intakes. I have a feeling I used three eighths for both my tubes because the tubing on the skimmer was larger than quarter inch. It was kind of some weird rubber tubing. Uh, top secret toys. <clears throat> now I want to know what the, those toys are. Uh, says, what's a good reef safe RAS for a 75 gallon tank? I really like the yellow coarse RAS because it's a good working RAS and it's not super crazy aggressive. Now as it gets bigger and kind of outgrows that 75 gallon tank, which they can do, uh, it may start eating snails. So that will be, but that's way down the line. If you can get yourself an adorable little tiny one right now, it's just this little blip of yellow swimming around your tank. It's really, really pretty and you can enjoy that. And then after um, it grows bigger, maybe by then you're looking at getting a bigger tank anyway, you can move it over. But if you find it eating snails, I mean, that's just kind of normal. That's what it wants to eat. It wants meaty foods. You could try to circumvent that by giving it meaty foods like krill in your daily uh, offerings to the tank. But that fish will just get bigger and hungrier <laughs> and needs more and more krill. See what I'm saying? So, you know, like I said, I've had them for many, in many of my tanks over the years and I enjoy them. And someone said, man, that yellow course is huge. And you have no problems with your snails. And I was like, no, why would you say that? And right as I'm saying it and we're looking at the tank together, it goes, pow, it hits a snail. and It went down. I was like, what? I've never seen that before. It was timing is everything, right? So, uh, yeah, they can get to the point where they want to really eat some stuff in your tank. But it's not like they're going to eat everything. They're going to eat some of your snails. And then they're going to be nice and fat and full and they're not going to be hungry for a while. Um, Will says, my lady wants a blue clam in the next six months. That's a nice one to shoot for. You know, I've had people ask me, why don't you have any clams in your tank? I don't really have an excuse other than I just haven't seen any I wanted to buy. But uh, when I do come across some when I'm really motivated, I'll go out and hunt me down some. And uh, I'll find somebody that sells them and I'll get me a few because I'd like to have more than one and put them in a group in one area of the tank maybe in the, the corner of the tank. I don't know. It's got to be a spot that gets well lit. And uh, I really like the Maximas. Do you, what you, uh, do you know which one you want to get? Have you read up on clams? Did you know there's a clam book by James Fothery? It's a really good read. Uh, Rick says, what reef-related gifts did you get for Christmas? Well, there's a lot of reflections in here, but this one here was a gift. So that's Spock. Um, and this was carved out of wood and then stenciled and painted. Jason Langer made it, and uh, it's beautiful. So it's up on the wall forever, and it's actually life-size. It's the actual dimensions of Spock, which is really, really cool. And he did all the art from pictures of Spock. So that was a really, really nice gift. I love it. Um, what else did I get that was reef-related? I know there's, oh, I got this really cool book about the ocean. And uh, it was by the Smithsonian, and the pictures in there are phenomenal. I only got through the first couple of pages. and was like, wow. <laughs> so I've got a lot to read. And I'm looking forward to just sitting down and enjoying that book when I have some, some free time, which you think I'd have. But it seems like every day I have so much to do. So those are two. Uh, speaking of gifts, I tried to buy this thing during what? I think it was Black Friday. So this is a Wise camera. Um, they're sold on Amazon, and there there's some really cheap ones. This one was about $37, maybe $38. And it's a camera that moves 360 degrees. And it has a spot in the bottom for a memory card. And I got this. Well, I bought it. But then it never showed up. And then one day I got an email saying, you got a refund. I was like, okay. I still want it. So I bought it again. And uh, so I started to hook it up yesterday. And it wasn't talking to my Wi-Fi network. So I got to figure out what's going on. But the plan is where I can move this around and maybe use it in the fish room to like see the sump you know, for my phone. I can take it outside and put it where Minion is to watch the table while it's cutting acrylic while I'm at the desk. Or um, I can put it outside and just watch the squirrels eat from the bird feeder. I don't know. So I got this, and so it's sort of reef related. <laughs> it's business related. But I got that. And then this is not a, a gift that I got, but it's something I stumbled across when I was at Petco. So this right here, why is it so bright? Oh well, sorry. Anyway, it's, it says Cold Life Reptile Safe Products. And it's a sifting scoop that's made completely of plastic. And I thought, man, this would be really nice to like scoop out the larger stuff off the sand bed that's on the surface. You know, the little bits of gravel and rock and you know, little bits of bone skeleton that gets in the sand bed. And I thought, man, it's all plastic. This is pretty nice. So I'm planning to try this out. And I don't think this costs much. Maybe it was 3 or $5. And I found it at Petco. 
So if you were looking for a way to like clean up your sand bit a little bit, maybe, I mean, you might want to wait till I try it, but I mean, this might be just the thing you need and it's in the reptile section. So that's a couple of cool things. What did you get that was reef related? I just feel like for the last couple of months, it's just been nonstop Christmas. I've just bought so many things that it wasn't necessarily under the tree, <laughs> but it ended up in the house like it was a present to me, so. Ah, oh, the Musical Reef has a great question. My JBJ45 is making my floor sag. Now think about that. It's a little tiny cube that weighs quite a bit, and it's making the floor sag. Now you want to put a bigger tank in the same area. And so he says, can I put a large piece of wood underneath to distribute the load over the area of the wood so that way the uh, floor doesn't sag? Maybe. Um, we don't, I mean, you have to tell me more, but I don't know what your floor is made of. I mean, is it a hardwood floor? Is this a pier and beam home? Is it, It's clearly not a concrete foundation. But the way floors are usually made on, this, on pier and beam homes and then on the second floor, for example, is you have a bunch of joists. And these joists either run perpendicular to the wall or they run parallel with the wall. And if they're running parallel with, the tank tends to not create a sag, but it could topple towards you or it could kind of teeter toward the wall. More likely it's going to topple towards you because that's where you're standing and you're adding more weight, so it's bringing the tank towards you. If they're perpendicular, if the tank is sitting on top of the joist, again, it should stay, but it might do a little bit of a rocking motion. If it's between joists and the joists are far apart, it could create a low spot. And laying a board across there is a workaround. It won't be very pretty. You might be able to hide it. But I'd much rather use reinforce the floor from below if, that, if at all possible. Um, if you can get underneath because the house is a basement, for example, and you could put a couple of jack stands with a 4x4 post and just beef up that area completely so that it doesn't move at all, then you can put whatever tank you want there and there won't be any sag anymore. But uh, trying to just lay another band-aid on top of the floor to kind of hit more joists, I don't know. It, unless you could really hide it, I don't know that you're going to be happy enough with it. I'd much rather see you secure it. Now, the other option, if you can't get to it from below, is to literally cut open the floor, put in more joists, you know, really beef it all up, and put new flooring on top, and then put the tank in place, and it won't budge at all. So you have that choice as well. You just have to pick what do you want to do, which is going to make you the happiest, and be the best looking, and most reliable. So you have to figure that out. Hey, Will, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Bradley says, can I add an anemone to my two-foot tank? Won't it sting the corals if I get more? Yeah, you can add an anemone to a two-foot tank. Um, but as it gets bigger, it will take up space, because that's what they do, and whatever it touches, it can kill. So that is part of making choices of what livestock you want to put in your aquarium. If you are, And keep in mind, too, that one anemone can split and become two could become three, could become four. You know, it can just do that, and then they spread out everywhere, and they just sting everything, and you start losing corals. So you have to decide what corals matter to you most. And, you know, what corals do you have now? Because you just say corals, well, corals could be green star polyps, it could be a toast of leather, it could be this crazy expensive home wrecker SPS coral, you know, because certain ones are more hardy, more durable, but still don't tolerate the nonstop touch of the anemone. And in my anemone cube, I have this really pretty a can that we trimmed off all the edges so it looked nice and it looked like a slice of pizza and we put it exactly where we wanted to look in the tanks would be pretty and in the meantime the anemones have been putting their tentacles on it and they basically killed the top half because they touched it and that's an a can and, a and that's an a can echinata which is a very powerful a can and it's just being eroded away so that did not work out because at the time when we placed it the anemones weren't near it but then they did their little thing and they move around or they uh, spread out. And as they touched it, they did some damage. Now, I didn't lose my entire ACAM, but I definitely lost a section where there, there was constant contact. So you have to think about that when you're putting in something like an anemone in a small aquarium. What can you tolerate versus uh, maybe not doing that at all because you enjoy the other corals more? So that's kind of how it is. It, it's a living biotope. It's not a picture. It's not a photograph. You can't just Photoshop the perfect look because it constantly changes because these are living animals that live and breathe and do things. And they are going to do whatever they want to do when you're not looking or even while you're looking. <laughs> and then you're going to have to decide, do you have to interact and remove? Do you have to move things apart? Do you have the space to move things apart? Uh, 
Uh, Varian says, I catch myself looking at new stuff for my tank when my tank isn't doing well. It's definitely a challenge to tell myself to stop researching new things to add and spend time on the husbandry. Yeah, um, one of the videos I did recently, uh, I'd say about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I talked about um, what to do when you're feeling defeated. And uh, then I think I followed it up with a video about when should you just stop the hobby. But uh, what you really want to do is you want to clean up what you have and correct what you have before you get anything else new. And I think you got that from what your, your comment, so thank you for chiming in with your thoughts, because it's real. That's exactly how many of us feel. Uh, top Secret Toy says, that eel will eat your gobies eventually. It's possible these are some larger gobies, but I don't know. I mean, yes, they can. They could even eat clownfish, you know, if it gets big enough. This is a little tiny guy from now. I see changes in the future, and when that happens, maybe some livestock will be moved around for um, logistical reasons, <laughs> like safety, and maybe even for looks. Like, these gobies are never in, never visible, so let's move them into a tank where they're by themselves, where they can be out in the open and look beautiful all day long. So I think that's going to happen. I think when Caitlin gets her own tank, we'll be moving those gobies over, and then the eel will be fine in that tank, and he'll just have the Bengais and the clownfish to chase. Uh, Paul says, how many fish are too many fish for a reef tank? I have a four foot, 90 gallon tank. Well, a long time ago, people used to say you have one inch of fish per gallon. So you know, back in that thought process, you think, well, I can have 90 inches of fish. But if you had nine 10 inch tanks in there, they would never survive. It would be a nightmare for that 90 gallon tank. It's way too much population. So I don't recommend that kind of a rule. And I just, I wanna bring it up because someone might say, hey, I've read this. Well, there's a lot of things we've read. doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> we want to have the right bio load for the tank. And so if you're wanting to have a lot of fish, I recommend getting itty bitty tiny things that are just pretty and small and stay small. Um, if you pick very small livestock, you can have a lot in there and not really affect the bio load. But as soon as you start adding things like tangs, which are basically small whales, uh, they're big polluters. You know, my 400 gallon has uh, five tangs in it. And I really don't want to add another. I, I feel like it's enough. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, having too many in there will add to the bio load. It adds to the nitrate problems. And then you're constantly trying to outwit them. And I mean, really, I have a lot of fish in the enemy cube. And then I have quite a few fish in my 400 gallon. And I'm always talking about nitrates on this channel. <laughs> so you want to keep that in mind, you know, that you want to have the right balance and not go overboard. So I guess the best thing you do is, you know, like, for example, going to Club Mealers Reef, I'll put that on the screen if I can find my little tile here. If you're already a member of Club Meals Reef, you know, then go in there and post and say, here's the list of fish I'd like to get for my 90 gallon tank, or here's the fish I have now, and I'd like to get these fish. And let's let's discuss and let's see what's a good working plan for you. Maybe you'll end up saying, oh, I guess I can only get two more, and then I'm maxed out, but these are the prettiest ones ever, so it's totally worth it. So you might be able to do that. But there is no just like <laughs> Here you go, this many fish by the pound can handle your 90 gallon aquarium. I hope that helped. Um, uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, any word on the possible availability of the Versa continuous pumps? I actually wrote uh, Ecotech because I sell their products and said, you know, what's going on with the Versas? And I didn't see a reply. So I guess the answer is it's still not available yet. COVID has been a real number on a lot of companies over the last year. And, you know, as people are coming up for water, <laughs> so to speak, there's still things that we're going to struggle to get. Um, I, just between me and you all, I feel like, because of the way the economy works and having to lay off people, companies like Ecotech and others probably are preferring to only sell items that have a bigger margin than a dosing pump, which is, you know, going to make a few bucks. And so rather than spending man hours on building these little tiny dosing pumps, they'd rather sell you an expensive pump, for example. That's just me thinking out loud. Um, you know, I sell all kinds of products on my website from a $5 item all the way to, you know, a $900 item. 
and uh, or actually more. <laughs> and so, of course, I'd love to sell lots of the big expensive ones, but you know, the everything all adds up to income. So that's what I do. But I understood why Ecotech suddenly was only focused on their pumps and lights. And matter of fact, they couldn't even keep up with the light demand. Everyone wanted the lights, and they couldn't have enough people working because of COVID. So it, uh, they had to put verses on hold, and we're still waiting. And I really, I have one on my calcium reactor. I like it. So I would love to be able to get those in and put them up for sale again on my website. Um, Lynn says, with your experience and knowledge, would you ever have the desire to move up from a 400 gallon to a thousand gallon? Or is it just too much money or too much work? Thanks. Uh, you know, this is a lot of work for the tank behind me. And it's enough work for one person. My friend Ryan, who has a beautiful reef tank, it's a full on SPS system from end to end. It's huge. I mean, it's 10 feet long. It's four feet wide. It's impossible to reach anything. <laughs> he, he even has a walk board. But you have to still lay across the middle of the tank to reach down and do things in his aquarium. And I would not relish working on that tank. I, it's just too frustrating. I like this size tank behind me, which is uh, seven feet long, and it's three feet wide, and it's 30 inches tall. And going bigger, number one, I don't have space in the house for it. If I did it, I'd be extending into what is the dining area. And right now, that's a nice corner that you can walk into the kitchen. <laughs> so putting a bigger tank there, and then it would stick out a foot more into this room. No, I don't see myself doing anything like that. Uh, not that I want to downsize. I just want to kind of stay with this. When I chose this tank and designed it and drew it up on graph paper with a pencil and ruler, I called this my dream tank. And ironically, I did that in 2010. And I said, this will be the tank I have for the next 10 years. <laughs> and here we are, 10 years later, I still have it. So uh, no, I don't want to do it. It's just too much work. That's a lot of glass to clean. Uh, when things go wrong in the water, it takes a lot chemically to correct it. Um, with equipment, you need oversized equipment to do everything you need. Uh, bigger pumps, bigger skimmers, um, lighting, you have to have more light fixtures, heaters, you need more heaters because there's so much more water, uh, water changes, which I know I don't do a lot of, but cost money for salt, and the bigger the water change, the more salt you use, the more expensive that water change costs you, so it just becomes a sinkhole, but having a much bigger tank would allow me to have much bigger colonies and then I have to ask myself, would I end up with a thousand gallon tank with like five major colonies <laughs> like I do in the 400? Or would I have 50 Q colonies? I don't tend to do the bonsai reefing where you're always trimming it and keeping the shape small. So I think that I would end up having some really big dominant ones with some pretty stuff scattered here and there. But no, I don't think I would want to work on such a big tank. The 400 is more than enough for me. McGrath says, what is your opinion on carbon dosing? Uh, it's been around for over 10 years now. It works, but the question I feel many people don't ask themselves is, do I even need that right now? Because you want to do carbon dosing when your tank needs it. But I feel like a lot of people say, oh, I heard you got to do carbon dosing. I better just do that from the very beginning. That way nothing gets out of control. But they end up making themselves so frustrated because their tank is not cooperating because it's going through all this craziness because you're introducing an extra element into the system that is not natural. You're literally pushing something in because you're hoping to um, outwit something. So I would say when your tank is dealing with really high phosphate or really high nitrate and you want a carbon dose, yeah, you can go that route. You'd think I'd be doing it right now, but I'm not. Uh, Alex says, what tank manufacturer would you recommend for a 120-gallon tank with a stand and exterior overflow? Hmm. I think Planet Aquarium would make those. And... Uh, You'd probably be happy with their, their work. It seems really nice. There's a um, couple of the come. Oh, um, I don't know if Glass Box makes. No, Water Box. I don't know if Water Box makes external overflow boxes or not. And then Glass Cages have been around a long time, but I haven't seen the quality of their work, so I don't know if it's better than before, if it's gotten worse. I just don't know. But that's one that was a. A nice option for a lot of people back in the day because their stuff was pretty inexpensive, but there were some caveats. Like the first thing is when you got a tank from them, you were told by them, do not put water in this for three weeks. And people were like, oh. and it just made me feel like they built it yesterday, <laughs> you know, and so you have to wait for the silicone to cure. 
and uh, that could be exactly what it was. But uh, I don't know what where things are these days, how they're keeping up, if it's if it's been sitting and curing. And I just don't know. And I don't know if everything looks good. You know, how are the seams? How is the how are the cuts? Are the edges polished? And then if you want to spend a lot of money, Reef Savvy makes some really pretty tanks. But theirs is an inter-external overflow box. It's one they actually patented themselves. It's very narrow and hides against the back wall. It's called a ghost overflow, I think. I think that's right. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Steve, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh at you. He said I had my yellow coarse rasp for years. I had the cover off the tank for five minutes. He jumped and the cat had him or ate him. I failed him. Yeah, that stuff can happen. It's unfortunate that it just happens all of a sudden spur of the moment. And uh but I mean, there's people that have screened the entire top of their tank and they still find the fish found some sliver of a gap to jump through and lay on top of the, the screen and died inches above the water because they found a way to wiggle out. It's, it's so frustrating. And all I can say is look for every single crevice and fill it. <laughs> you know, just leave nothing. So unless that fish can fit through the grid itself, it can't get out. But that's going to be a very challenging, and you know you'll have to really work it to make sure you get that just right. But I'm sorry to hear about your fish. Uh, Chef says, "Will a six-line ras help control my bristle worms, or mostly eat the pods in the tank?" I have a 125-gallon tank. If you're trying to control bristle worms uh, to keep their uh, population down in the tank, the six-line wouldn't be my choice. The long-nosed hawkfish is one that does it. They like to eat them but they don't eat them all. So you still have some in your cleanup crew or your De detritus crew. <laughs> and uh, then the other one you could use as an arrow crab, which is really cool looking. And you put those in your tank and you'll have far less bristle worms visible in your tank. Marion says, how do you know if a tiger cucumber is starving? I have a large, I have large grain, uh, three millimeter sand. Hey, so do I. And not sure if it's able to process it. It is out all night on my glass and sand. Not sure if it's because it's hungry. Um, they can, they, okay, when you're watching your tiger tail cucumber, which I have many in my tank, you'll see that they're blotting the surface of the sand like little mop heads, and they're grabbing that and putting it in their mouth, and they're consuming it, and they're pooping it out the other side. If you're seeing little weird hills of what looks like pelletized sand, it's definitely eating. Um, if it gets shriveled up, it gets thinner and thinner and smaller and smaller, it's obviously not doing well. If it's, you know, the size of your pinky or, or larger, it's doing well. They do go up the glass sometimes. They can get into pumps. So you do have to be aware of that. But uh, I bought one tiger tail way back, probably in 2003, 2004, somewhere in then. And I thought, oh, that thing's so cool. And there has been times where I'm counting in my tank now, and there's like 12. And I've given a few away. And I've put a couple in the refugium. I put some in the enemy cube. I mean, I, I keep dispersing them. What they do is they tear themselves in half, and the two halves crawl away, and then you have two cucumbers. Uh, I don't try to split them or do it intentionally. I, I only saw it do it once on its own. The rest of the time I just saw more cucumbers in my tank because they found a way to do it on their own. But it's not like they hit a certain size and now it's time to tear either. I just, I just found them. And sometimes when I was breaking down one of my previous tanks and taking the plumbing down, uh, as I was cutting the pipe and opening it up, a cucumber would fall out. It was living in the pipe where it had zero light and was just snacking whatever came blowing through the pipe, which is amazing to me. Uh, Stefan says, you need to put your phone on the 2.4 gigahertz network to get the WISE camera connected. If you're using the 5G or 5 gigahertz, it won't because it only has 2.4 antenna. You know, I thought that. Uh, you know, I used my first one and that didn't, you know, which is my default 5G, like you said. Then I tried the 2.4 because I thought, okay. And neither one connected. So then it said on the, on the app, it said, reboot your router. I'm like, thanks. And, you know, no one wants to reboot their router. <laughs> so this morning... Nothing on the television was working. Everything said disconnected from the internet, so I rebooted the router. So technically, this would be the perfect time to do exactly what you said, switch to 2.4 on my phone, get the wires connected, and then start messing around and see what it can do. So thank you for your input. I appreciate that. Uh, 
Uh, Berkey's Reef says, I used a gift card to add a recirculating CO2 scrubber to my skimmer. The pH has increased from 8.2 to 8.3-ish and is much more stable, only fluctuating a range of 0.4. That's great. Yeah, um, a lot of people like doing that, and it's really good this time of year when you're keeping your home closed up because it's so cold outside and you can't just bring in fresh air. So by using CO2 media, you can scrub out that CO2 out of the water, and uh, yeah, it'll improve your pH. That's the whole point. So I'm glad that worked. And a gift card. Didn't you have to use money? How nice was that? Um, Tony says, what's the best way to do a complete sand change and avoid a tank crash? Love your streams. Um, if you're going to change all the sand out, I would do 25% of the sand bed once a week rather than trying to do it all in one day. Uh, it doesn't matter what size tank you're doing it on. I mean, yes, if you're doing an itty bitty little nano that's seven gallons or something, yeah, just change your sand. But any kind of an established reef tank, you know, that's three feet, four feet, six feet long, I would work in sections and I would work my way across. And you'll put in the new sand and you'll see it next to the old and you can tell the difference. And you might lose a little bit of the new sand during the, the next weekly cleaning as you're getting the next part out. But that would be my recommendation. And by doing 25%, you won't throw the system into a massive chaos because 75% of your sand bed is still full of benthic life. And then week two, week three, you know, the, or the first sand you put in, you know, from week one will have gotten some, uh, some critters into it by now, some worms, some pods, uh, some uh, little, well, more worms. <laughs> Spaghetti worms and such will be migrating over there. And by doing that, you'll end up with a, a nice clean sand bed and you'll get rid of the old. Myself, I am wanting to continue to sand vac my sand bed to get out some of the ancient detritus that's in there. And it's just such a hurdle. It's just mentally, it's like, ugh, I need to do it. I don't want to do it. Fortunately, Caitlin says she'll help me do it, which makes it nice for me because that, a second person always makes it, it makes any task easier to complete. So it's just a matter of us doing it. The weather was really cold for the last couple of days. I mean, right now the weather's nice. It's 55 degrees, but a couple of days ago it was, you know, low 30s, and I was not about to deal with a sand bed situation. And because I have to then siphon it out, run tubing outside for the water change, take the barrel back. I didn't want to deal with all that. And it was raining nonstop for a couple of days too. So, like I said, not trying to make excuses, just that's what reality was. But it's the water in the barrel's ready. I want to do water change today. Even if I don't change, if I don't touch the sand bed, I'll still do the water change. But it's always best to do in sections. Uh, Masood, I hope I said that right, says, I need some info about plankton dosing. What is the benefit? Well, plankton uh, is a food. Now, it's a size of food that's in the ocean. It's naturally occurring, and uh, there's certain animals that consume it. And so by getting plankton-sized food that you're adding to your tank, which you, know, you would think things like phytoplankton, rotifers. Um, what else is out there? Uh, I'm trying to think of live foods right now off the top of my head. There's there's a bunch of little things that are out there that different companies like Reef Nutrition sells. And then there's powders, like the stuff I like from Benner Reef, which is plankton size. And you can pour that into your reef and there's this big cloud and the water is soupy for a couple of hours and it clarifies. But anything that wants very minute bits of food can consume it, where the bigger stuff, like little nuggets of stuff that's blown around the fish will chomp into. And I've watched fish bite some of the Benner reefs that didn't, you know, completely dissolve into dust. Then I saw some come out their gills as they swam. So it stayed in the system. And it's funny because you see the fish get super excited because apparently all the ingredients are so yummy. But what's happening is they're smelling it, but they can't get it because it's too small for their fishy mouths. So the corals get it instead. So the benefit is you're feeding corals, you're feeding invertebrates, you're feeding anemones. Uh, feather dusters, things like that in your tank. Sponges eat planktonic sized food. So these are all benefits. Uh, Rob says, is that t-shirt available on uh, Neil's Reef? No, this is a uh, Reef Trace shirt that we used for the trade show. Let me uh, turn around for you for a second. I'll turn this off so you can get the full effect. So this is the Reef Trace app that I'm a partner in. And uh, he, the developer that does the app also does my website. And uh, so we got these shirts for one of the Magna shows. And uh, so I threw it on today because I just liked wearing the shirt. 
<laughs> I do like it says Reef like a pro. Uh, let's see, go like that. So it's kind of cool. Um, I, they're eventually going to be making more shirts, uh, newer ones, different style. Um, but they've never been available because he only bought like, I don't know, a dozen to use at the trade show. Uh, no sump reefing says anything that can stop my damn dinos. <laughs> you know, dino flagellates are a very big problem in a reef tank and they're very hard to eliminate or eradicate. So there are some products on the market. Uh, there's one that comes to mind called Dino X by Fauna Marin. There are threads about it on forums where you can read pages and pages, well, hundreds of pages of people trying different approaches, including completely encapsulating their tank in plastic so that no light gets to it. They're dosing peroxide. Uh, I've read Insanity, like adding bleach to the tank. I mean, there's so many different theories out there. But what I would like to point you to are some of the better articles that are written way back in the early 2000s, like the one by Randy Holmes Farley. He has an article in reefkeeping.com, which is a magazine that's a website. And it was uh, battling dinoflagellates. And you can just type in dinoflagellates, Randy Holmes Farley, and Google will take you right to it. And you can read a very long article about it. He talks about the different things you can do, including raising pH in the tank, um, not doing water changes. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that were done back then. It, it, they're more of a problem these days. And one of the, there's even groups just for dinoflagellate battles, you know, the dinoflagellate group on Facebook that you can join and maybe get some advice and some tips of how to handle it now. One of the methods that was put out there <coughs> about two or three years ago was about microbubbles which are far, far, far finer than just the air bubbles you see in your protein skimmer. And by pumping in these micro bubbles into your tank, you would actually cause these bubbles to land on everything and stick to the dinoflagellates and float them to the surface to where they'd go down and get caught in filter socks and the protein skimmer. But um, that was an, a, quite a process. It takes weeks as well because you have to do this every single night. And you have to set up your tank in a way that if there's a power outage, it doesn't drain your tank in the process. So that's very important to not overlook. Um, there's also the dosing of certain bacteria to compete with the dinoflagellates to basically rob the dinos of their fuel source so that they weaken and, and decay and, and die off. One of the things I suggested a while back was to use Live Rock Enhance and to use that two, three times in your tank each week for a few weeks and it should basically destroy them. <laughs> it was my theory. And a few people tried it and said it worked for them. And a few people said I couldn't tell the difference, which sounds like everything we ever do in this hobby. But um, my frag tank has been just garbage forever. I, I've neglected the hell out of it. I've told you guys over and over. And uh, I handled, I solved one problem. I got rid of all the bubble algae. I was proud of myself. And then cyano kicked in. I was like, oh. And I didn't deal with it because I was just, you know, dealing with the reef. And so I kind of let it go. And now I'm seeing like bubbles and crud in there. And I was like, all right. So I've been putting a live rock enhance in there for the last couple of days. And, uh, you know, I've done it twice already. And I'm going to keep doing that for a couple of weeks and see if I can kind of remove that problem. But there, that whole tank has so many issues. <laughs> There's a reason why I just don't even want to look at it. Hey, Ron, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, Insane Reefer says, do you think adding a bigger Nasso will cause less aggression with my yellow tang? I had a Nasso and my yellow bullied him to death and the Nasso was there before him. Wow, uh, well is the yellow tang really really big? Because the other thing is how big is your tank? Can you handle a larger Nasso? Did you do anything like the acclimation box, like a, the Peacemaker SL, or anything to keep them separated for a while before you release them together into the same system? You may need to remove, I mean, some of the tricks that people do is they remove the, uh, the the aggressive fish out of the tank, put it in a quarantine or a hospital tank or even in the sump for a few weeks, and then they bring it back into the tank. You can also rearrange the rock work. And I saw the craziest suggestion the other day. I had never heard of this. They said, just litter your tank with all kinds of weird crap that doesn't belong, basically like PVC fittings and, and plastic tools and whatever, just so there's stuff all over in the tank to confuse all the fish. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And then they won't be so busy attacking each other because their whole environment is weird. Like, what is going on? And I thought, wow, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have a lot of Fisher Price toys and you just want to throw them in an aquarium, more power to you. Um, I would probably either do the acclimation box to where they see each other for three, four days before releasing. Um, 
or maybe the yellow tang needs to go and you have to get a new younger friendlier yellow tang and let that mean one go to the fish store where someone else with a bigger tank can take it which would be great because whoever gets it next it won't be aggressive because it's going to a whole new environment it might take care of two things all at once Uh, Will says, do you know of any marine fish that don't get along with mollies? I've acclimated four and have them in my 75-gallon tank. No, I don't really. I mean, I guess there's some predator fish out there that wouldn't get along with mollies, and they'd devour them like a lionfish or a soapfish or something like that. But uh, no, I don't think there's a... The typical reef-safe fish that we usually get, those are... Um, they're going to get along fine with mollies. I had to stop that light behind me. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I hate my reef, it just looks like it's on fire. But uh, basically, Will, what you could do is say, these are the fish I'd like to get. What do you think? And we can double check the list. Uh, Ron says, how many clowns are in the anemone queue? Did you add them all at once? How many spotsintis would you recommend in a 40 breeder? That's got to be a typo. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, there's 12 clownfish in that tank. And there was one in the tank when I added all the babies. And all the babies went into that tank, and she basically accepted them. It was really cool to watch. And they just grew. And then there was some aggression, and I had one for sure die. Um, two or three or... No, actually, three I had to remove, and I put them in the frag tank, and they're in there with that mess. And they're fine. <laughs> and all the, the other... You know, the rest that are in there, there's 12. They're, they're healthy, and, you know, they just do their thing from day to day. They're... They just live their lives. But I got all the clowns from one breeder. They were all at least an inch long. They were about six months old. And I put them all in with that one single oscillaris that was all by herself. And uh, she was kind of depressed and hiding the tentacles and would barely eat. And when I added those clowns, th I remember watching very closely. It was crazy. Three of them swam up to the side of that clownfish and kissed her belly. That's what it looked like. She was on her side. And these three fish came on just kind of kissed her. And she's like, okay, I like you. And the rest is history. And she's the mom in the tank. The others have gotten quite large. Some of them have. But she still seems to be in charge, which is pretty cool because she is getting to the point where it's, a couple of them look bigger than she is. But somehow it's working. She's ruling the tank. But, yeah, if you're trying to put a lot of clowns in the tank, you want to get all the exact same ones. And you want to um, get them young. So they're very small. And when you first get those clowns, they'll probably be in a ball in the corner. It's really neat. They swim in this fish ball. And then, you know, as they get more comfortable, they release into the tank. And with a 40-gallon tank, you said how many? Um, a 40-gallon breeder with a sump or with hang-on-back material uh, equipment. But uh, I don't know. I'd go for 10. <laughs> Uh, I, I pretty much had, I think I had 16, yeah, I had 16 to start, and, uh, and, and I'm down to 12. Three are in another tank, at least. I only lost one, and they were put in years ago. So I wouldn't overdo it. I remember initially, I was like, I want 40. I want the tank filled with, with clownfish, like I see at the public aquarium. So I have this giant tank, and just thousands of clownfish, and hippo tanks, and so amazing. But they have monster filtration behind it, so they can get away with that. And with mine, it's not monster filtration, it's refiltration. So... I was told, don't get 40, get 20, and I ended up getting 16, so it, it worked out, but like I said earlier in the stream, I battle nitrates because I have a lot of little mouths in my tank, you know, and those tanks are all tied together in the same body of water. It is what it is. Oh, thank you. Reef and Sea Forever says the Ecotech has replied saying that the Versa pumps are going to come out in June. That would be nice. Oh, Rob, thank you for bringing that up. You know, he was talking about different reef tanks you could purchase. And he mentions Red Sea Reefers are another good one. Uh, I don't know if they do external overflow boxes, do they? But I do like their kits where it seems to be all in one. I think they're great because you can just open up the box and set it all up and have a tank ready to go and then just add the water and, and the livestock and, you know, the sand and rock. I, I, it's a really cool kit. Uh, if you're wanting something simple that's not going to be a lot of work, if you're not trying to, I want this pump, and I want this skimmer, and I want this controller, and I want this, if you can accept their their kit and, you know, maintain it, that's a great, it, it's a really nice setup. I, matter of fact, you know, we all have different personalities, but I remember the, um, 
when I saw the Red Sea Reefers at Magna and I'm looking at the different setups, the thing that came to my head was like, this would be a great tank for doctors. <laughs> Why would I think that? But it's 100% true because doctors are busy all day long saving lives. They don't want to come home and mess with their tank nonstop. They definitely don't want to puzzle. I mean, they. Uh, <laughs> I'm speaking for all of them, right? Uh, in general, they don't want to sit there and try to assemble parts from all over the world. They want to buy something. They want to set it up. They want to enjoy it. And uh, I've been proven right many times by doctors. So I, I'm saying this because it, it was just a weird thing came in my head and it turned out to be 100% true. Uh, Ryan is a doctor, by the way, with a thousand gallon reef, and he did not get a Red Sea Reefer. <laughs> so I'm not batting a thousand, but I was not far off on my mark when I first thought these would be great for doctors, doctor's offices, waiting rooms. You know, they want to set up a tank and they want something nice for their uh, employees and their uh, clients to see while they're waiting. And it's proven true time after time after time. And lots of people like the Red Sea Reefer setup. Some people say, well, I don't like the drain, or I don't like the skimmer, or I don't like there's no room for a refugium. Well, I mean, you know, that's like saying, I bought this car, but I don't like the cup holder. Like, yeah, but you still bought the car. <laughs> you just have to find something that will fit that stupid cup holder, which is my complaint with my Tundra. I hate that there's no cup that fits that thing properly. And I've gone to Toyota and said, well, what cup do you sell that fits that cup holder? And they don't. They have some mugs, but it doesn't make it hold any better than any other thing I put in there. It's just dumb. Uh, top secret toy says, do your purple and yellow tanks get along? Yeah, the purple is more dominant and does chase the yellow, but the yellow is doing fine. I had two yellows and about, and I had them for about five years, and I lost one mysteriously two months ago. So um, I'm down to one purple, one yellow, um, the coal, and spot. So I'm down to four tangs in my tank. So there's room for the Achilles after all, isn't there? We'll have to see. Huh. The spiritual counselor said, um, he has a friend whose name is Sir Held Open, uh, and he helped me make a six foot long overflow for my 440 gallon tank, to which we had to hold against the glass for an hour. Uh, I bet you did because you were holding it where you wanted it versus like laying the tank on its front and setting on the back and just like sit there and cure overnight. That would be quite a long wait standing there holding it together, but I'm glad you got it done and I'm glad it worked. It is a funny name. Uh-oh. Uh, Chris says, I have a small candy cane colony, no, the coral colony, clownfish and firefish, and I woke up this morning to a 70 degree tank. I swapped out my heater with a spare one, any point on what to watch for on my livestock. Well, you're warming up the tank back to temperature, so it's really going to be a matter of what can tolerate that sudden cold spell that they went through. I would watch your corals closely. Uh, the LPS coral, the candy cane, could potentially possibly develop brown jelly disease if it starts to decay. So watch for that. And if you do see brown jelly disease, you want to siphon that out of the tank. You don't want to blow it off to where it lands on something else and kills something else. The fish, if they are, you know, if they seem to be acting normally, I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't expect them to suddenly just die off because the water went down eight degrees overnight. But uh, I'm glad you had a backup heater. That's really good. And then you got the tank back on track. So I would just keep an eye on things. You don't have to add anything to the water, like you know some kind of chemical, because you didn't. the chemical didn't change. The water just got cold. So just warm it up and uh, keep an eye on things. Make sure everyone's happy and healthy. Alex says, can bristle worms do harm to corals? No, usually they don't. Sometimes you get a giant one, you know, something two feet, three feet, four feet. I mean, just some monster thing. And then there's others that are not really bristle worms that are even crazy, you know, 15 feet long that start off as a worm in your tank. The thing is when animals get too big in the tank, whether it's a worm or uh, something else, they get hungrier because they're, they have a bigger body, they have more mass, and they need more food. And there was a friend of mine up in... Uh, Washington, uh, Seattle area, and this thing was like 15 feet, and it would come out at night through the PVC pipe, that's where it lived, because it was in the structure that held the rock work up, and it, it used the pipe as a home. It would come out and just eat an entire field of zoanthids, and then go back to its pipe. And then the next night it went and ate something else in the tank. That's very, very unusual, but this thing was so big it had to eat. And if it couldn't eat a fish or something like that, it could 
eat something else, like in this case, zooanthids, which is weird, but it did it. So, but do they typically? No, usually they just kind of live around all your stuff and they look for things that are decaying or dying. And that's why a lot of times when a fish dies or a clam dies or there's just food in the bottom of the tank, you'll see bristworms coming out trying to grab it. Matter of fact, you'll see them come out to eat pellet food if they can get it. And if you watch closely, you'll actually watch the mouth of the bristleworm open up, take the pellet. You can see the pellet going through their body. So, no, they're, they're not out to destroy your corals if that's what you're worried about. CT says, what's your opinion on adding corals to a cycled tank that has little to no coralline algae, basically a three-month-old tank? Um, if your life support is all in place, if you have a few fish in there, then yeah, you can start adding corals. There's no problem with that. You don't have to wait for coralline to happen to have corals. What you need to have is good water quality. So if you have all the test kits and you're measuring and your alkalinity and your calcium and your magnesium are all in the right levels, if your temperature and your salinity is correct, yeah, you can start adding corals. You're going to need a good light on the tank. You're going to need a cleanup crew because the good light is going to grow algae. <laughs> so, you know, kind of don't go crazy. Don't go too fast. Don't put too much in at once because, like I said, you're going to have all this light in there to keep the corals healthy. It's going to grow a lot of algae and then you're going to need a big cleanup crew so it becomes this thing. So kind of maybe merge into it. Just kind of enjoy, find some things you like, and move your way into it. Hey, Joe, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, thanks for all the free advice. Love your streams. Oh. The spiritual counselor had a follow-up. He says, unfortunately, after holding that thing for an hour, it fell off once the clamp holding one side was, had moved. Um, had to use super glue instead of silicone later. I was afraid for holding it with the... Oh, man, that's, that sucks. Um, whenever I've done any kind of overflow boxes on a tank, I always lay the tank down, and I would bond the overflow box to the back wall, whether it's the inside or the outside, and then after it cured, then I stood it up and I did it along the base if it was internally. Um, I've had to fix some acrylic tanks for people before. I don't like doing it. I hate doing it, actually. And there was... Matter of fact, there was this one person... I went to dinner with him. Um, he was a friend of Kate's. And uh, we went to dinner at this taco place. And his name sounded really familiar, but I couldn't remember. And then he said to me, he said, you fixed my tank many years ago. And I was like, I did? And he says, yeah, you came out. You put down a ton of Weld on 16. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> and he said, and that tank held together forever. And I was like, well, that's awesome. And he was like, I've also bought a sum for you. And I was just, my memory... I mean, I have a lot of customers, and I names, I am the worst of names. And so I here I'm at dinner with the person that's actually a former customer, and I was just like, oh, man, I, I was really embarrassed. But, I mean, that's that's me. <laughs> I can't keep track of everything. I have so much fish stuff in my head. I can't keep the people stuff straight. But, uh, no, you can when you're gluing things on the tank, number one, the surface has to be very clean. Um, the material has to match the material. Like if it's an acrylic tank, I would be using weld on to secure the acrylic box to the acrylic tank. I'd make sure the tank was very clean first. I'd make sure the edges were very polished and smooth or, or scraped clean if need to be. And then apply them in place, put the bond, you know, the glue. I would not do the thing where I'm holding it up and waiting. There's no way. The thing's going to keep shifting every time you twitch. If you suddenly have to sneeze, if you have to answer the phone, you're, it's just going to move and it's going to weaken the bond. So... I like things to be in the right orientation. The rule of thumb when gluing acrylic is always to glue horizontally, which means the object has to be on the surface, flat. The other thing's on top of it, flat. You put the glue and you don't touch it. And if you mess with it, if you try to work quickly, if you try to hurry up and stand it up again, or I want to do this other edge, it usually doesn't work out well. So we, you know, I, I'm pretty meticulous in taking my time and that kind of stuff. If you're gluing an acrylic box to a glass tank, that's when you use silicone. I don't know how you made uh, super glue work, but I hope it holds long term and does really well for you. Let's see. Hi. <laughs> Reef Trace says, that's a sexy t shirt. Well, it should be, it's his. Let's see. Uh, ATF in the house says, what's the deal about dosing with live rock and hands? Will it deal with fuzzy grayish felt-like stuff, red fuzzy stuff on rocks and around corals? 
it cleans your rock. It's really neat. It's a it's some kind of a bacteria that eats decay. It, it devours waste. And so you have rock, you know, usually our live rocks covered in all kinds of living stuff. And, you know, you're sitting there you're kind of thinking, I wish it was gone. But if you use live rock enhance, like I said, I think it's twice a week. I think the first week is three times, and that's twice a week. And after about a month, just kind of look at the rock and say, did it make a difference? And I noticed it. It was funny. I was using it because I was told to. <laughs> so, you know, Tulio says, use it. Just do it. So I put it in the tank, like he said. And I'm reading a post on, on Facebook where another reef keeper was using it in their tank. And he's like, look at the rock work before and after. And I went and looked at the pictures like, wow, his rock looks great. So I walked over to my reef. And I'm like, wow, my rock looks great. <laughs> I mean, I was so oblivious to it. But no, it works really well at cleaning up and devouring all that stuff on the rock work you can't normally reach. So will it get everything? Maybe not. But will it make a difference to where you notice it? Yeah. I'd say in four to six weeks, you should see a difference in the tank. And it's not something you just use occasionally. You know, Julia recommends you just keep using it so that everything stays nice and clean and uh, keeps things under control. So I'm using the frag tank because that's the perfect place to dump it in and let it attack all the things I don't like. Uh, Jeremy says, are there any big fish that go in a nano tank, specifically a 30 gallon? I'm looking for a show fish. No, no, not in saltwater. We don't have big fish going small tanks. Uh, that's a terrible idea. So I'm sorry to rain on that dream of yours, but you're gonna have to find something small and suitable. Now, can you find something pretty for that tank? Yeah, um, but you're gonna need to maintain really good water quality. And I wouldn't go with big. I mean, 30 gallon, could be a really cool clownfish, you know, a pair. Um, it could be one of the dwarf angelfish, maybe. Um, yeah. The uh, There's some really big, weird-looking gobies out there. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, there's a few things out there. Uh, but you know what? It's a 30-gallon tank. Why limit yourself to some big showfish? Why not just decorate it with really pretty corals and some really cute little colorful fish so you can really enjoy it? Um, I mean, see, even like, I mean, I'd love to say, oh, well, you could put Antheus in there, but it's a 30-gallon tank. It's not big enough. Antheus need swimming room. They need to be fed all the time, and the filtration for a 30-gallon is not going to be good enough to keep up with that much food going into the tank. It'll just end up with problem after problem after problem, so I can't point you that way. So I'd rather you just get something that's nice, something of personality, something that's enjoyable, or maybe something entirely different. Like, you know, when I was a kid, and I wanted a tank, and I was told you can only have this many fish. I'm like, then I don't want any fish. I want all the invertebrates. And I just filled my 20 gallon long with all the hermit crabs I get my hands on. And the bottom just moved like the fish store where you buy hermit crabs. I just had all these shrimp and crabs, and I loved it because there was no limit to what was in the tank. But uh, once you start adding fish, you, your, bio, your bio load changes completely, and you end up limiting yourself in a lot of areas. So. Oh, you know, um, rather than big, how about tiny? Uh, the Yasha Gobi pistol shrimp pair is a beautiful tiny little guy. There's actually these uh, super crazy colorful, they look like flames, but they're so small. They're like an inch. And if you had this really cool tank with like, I don't know, let's say you had a lot of sand and you had some kind of a, a rock work that's very thin and branchy and just not like this big wall of rocks so you can see all the sand all the time. Then you could have that really cool pair, no matter where they're in the sand bed, they're visible. And you could enjoy them, rather than having a big fat fish that barely turns around once a day. So, you know, it's not like in the freshwater where they have a big arowana that just sits there and does nothing. You know, in saltwater, we, we use, we have lots of colorful options, and we want to make sure that it's going to fit the tank long term, and that it's going to be healthy and happy. And, uh, there, I mean, you could, there was a guy with a reef tank in in Houston, big, like 120 gallon. Was, it was rimless. It was it had nothing going on in it at all, except some SPS corals. And he got 40 blue damsels and put them in there. And we all thought, are you crazy? Why would you ever put damsels in your tank? And he says, because they're just schooling. It's really neat. And, you know, I, I, he, I couldn't disagree. It looked really neat. I've never seen anyone do it since, but he did it. So you've got that. If you want to have a cluster of fish, you could do something like the Bengai cardinal fish. Those are pretty, they're small, they get larger. The pajama cardinal fish is another type that has polka dots on it, like it's wearing pajama pants. And uh, those are fun and they stay in groups. 
So you might do that. Again, I'm trying to push you away from one big show fish. I just don't think that's the way to go. Uh, Berkey Reef says, I saw fix Fish of Hex is selling yellow tang decoys. <laughs> How do you think that'll work? I have no idea. I haven't, that's first I've heard of it. That's funny. Uh, Luis says, which is better, a sump or an all-in-one system? Well, I always push for the sump because I love to have the ability to put all my equipment down below where I can reach in, work on it, and leave the tank alone. With the all-in-one, it's going to be behind that wall. It's going to limit the space you have to put things in the back. Uh, it's more challenging, and you don't have a lot of choices where... I mean, I even tell people, <clears throat> you've got your tank, and typically they come with a stand. And I always say, get a bigger stand. You know, get one that's got six inches of space around the three, you know, around the front and sides, so that the tank is in the middle, and then you have a place to put things down while you're working, and you suddenly have much more space underneath for a bigger sump. So you can have a larger skimmer, you can have heaters, you can have uh, reactors, you can have return pump, you can have top-off container. There's so much you can do down there with that space. So I, I do recommend sumps over an all-in-one. But an all-in-one could be very practical for someone that doesn't have that kind of space. Um, they're limiting their budget. They just want to keep a very simple, very hardy tank. Uh, maybe they're trying to do a small tank in a college dorm room, so they need to be able to just have, you know, green star polyps and a yellow clown goby and uh, a leather coral, you know, <laughs> of some kind. And they're keep, they just want something pretty to look at to relax them. They don't want to be working on the tank, where you know a person's trying to keep SPS corals or uh, some of the more pricey chalices or the A cans or um, they want to get every flavor of zoanthid out there, they need more filtration to keep up with all the stuff going on chemically in the tank. Um, Insane Reefer uh, is following up on his earlier post about the, t the NASA and the yellow tang not getting along. And he said the NASA was in the tank first. I added the yellow tang a few months later because he was in a 29 gallon and they were doing just fine in the 180 gallon. I don't know why he started doing that. Well, I don't know either, but uh, the yellow tang has definitely become a bully for some reason. So it may have to be evicted. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's gonna work out then because if you brought it in and start causing that chaos, I don't know taking it out and putting it back in again is gonna make it any better. It may just have a chip on its shoulder and it doesn't like Nassos. Uh, the Grim Reefer says, is it possible to just use an all-in-one tank long-term to dose a tank? Oh, the all-in-one uh, chemical, it's like all the different elements mixed into one. I've heard of it. I don't know enough about it to answer that. I don't know if that would work long-term, but it's kind of neat. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it may work out for certain applications, but is it a one-size-fits-all scenario? I don't think so. I haven't heard enough people talking about how much they love it to think that it's something that will just work with every system out there. Glef says, what are your thoughts on reef addiction? Um, what's wrong with that? <laughs> we, uh, we all are addicted to something, whether it's chocolate or dogs or uh, nature or sports or, you know, exercise or, or reef tanks or cocaine. I mean, whatever it is. <laughs> we all have something we want. And uh, I think, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's a way of life. I got to have a tank as a kid, then I didn't have it for a long time. And then when I got back into the hobby, I've been in it since 97. And I have no desire to quit. I just keep going and going and keep things alive for as long as I possibly can. I've got some corals and two fish and a starfish that are they go all the way back to 2003. They're still in my tanks now. You know, so certain things live a long, long time. Other things don't work out. Um, new things overtake old things, whatever. You know, you see changes, but I'm in it for the long haul, I guess. I It would be weird not to have a tank. I'm sure some people out there would say, oh, I took a break and my life was never easier. I believe that's probably true, but I'm a glutton for punishment. So <laughs> I just enjoy the reef. I enjoy feeding my babies and making sure everything's happy and healthy and but it is, it's addictive. And uh, I feel like the fact that people come back to the hobby later kind of proves it's addictive because they don't just say, nope, I'm done. And, or, you know, whatever the reason is, and they quit, they come back. You know, there's a reason why we, we bleed and we sweat 
and we cry salty tears. Salt. It's all in our system. And that stuff, it, the salt water's in us. I mean, the earth is three-quarters salt, right? Something like that. So we, um, we have a reason to be passionate about this hobby. And it's so colorful and beautiful. <clears throat> mm. The Tattoo Diary says, Do you have any pointers on keeping DKH stable? I'm struggling to keep SPS due to a changing. Well, when you say stable, do you mean day-to-day -day or week-to-week? -week? Because you need to have some type of number that you're shooting for and stay as close to that day in, day out. It's going to go up and down each day a little tiny bit. So in other words, if your number was 8.5 and then you checked it later today and it was 8.4 and then you checked it tonight, it's 8.3. And then tonight your dosing pump comes on, and then you get up in the morning, it's 8.6, 8.5. And then it kind of, that little tiny variance is fine. But if it's 8.5, and then a couple days from now it's 7, and you dose something in the tank, and you bring it up to 9, and then, uh, you know, it kind of comes down to like 6 or 7.5, and then you bring it up to 10, or you overdose and it's at 11 all of a sudden, that kind of a roller coaster is bad. But we're supposed to be dosing the proper amount of alkalinity to the tank every single day, early in the morning. And by doing that, you should have the same number if you're graphing it. Like if you checked your tank every single day at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, since we work from home these days, you could see what the alkalinity is, and you should see pretty much the same number at 1 o'clock every single day, day after day after day after day. And if you are not, then you're not dosing enough, or you're not dosing properly, or you haven't made the solution correctly, you know, and so it's not mixed up properly. You could always buy something like ESV's Bionic, which is pre-mixed, and it works fantastically well. It's great for new hobbyists, and it's great for experienced hobbyists. I've used it for many years before I got into calcium reactors and dosing pumps. So that one there will help you, but you have to dose it every single day the right amount for your aquarium. If you do that, you'll end up with a really nice, happy coral uh, SPS reef. Um, Will uh, gave us his fish list of what he wants to have in his 150 gallon, his 75 gallon tank. So he said a black and white clownfish, a yellow goby, four mollies, a six line wrasse, a blue tang, and a fox face. Yeah, that sounds fine for a 75. I don't see any problems with that. Insane Reefer says, I have you on the big screen while I'm doing my water change. I wish I was doing my water change. How do I get you on my big screen? <laughs> Um, have says, do you have a green screen or is that your tank? That's my tank. It's behind me. Ta-da! See? I can touch it and it doesn't wiggle, so it's not green. <laughs> it's a real tank! Cindy! Caught up in time to watch live. Welcome! I haven't talked to you in months. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, do you need to dip Ketomorpha? And why is it impossible to find right now, and would you ever sell it? Uh, Ketomorpha... I don't keep it. I, I, can't, I don't do well with it, so it doesn't live. I, I tend to grow the same Calerpa forever because it never dies. And uh, I don't know why it's impossible to find right now, but this time of year is a really bad time to ship that kind of stuff. I really don't like encouraging people to order livestock, fish, corals, algae, anything this time of year, especially, you know, we just went through the worst time of year to order stuff because everything's delayed. And when you have livestock on the line, you need to get to you overnight with no delays and no problems and no the hub was closed because of a snow, snowstorm or something like that. But um, there's a place out of Florida, I think called liveplants.com, live-plants.com, and they have all kinds of algae. Maybe they have ketomorpha. I, I, there was some vendor selling algae to one of the Club Meals Reef moderators, and he ordered and whatever he paid. It was something ridiculous, you know, $25 or $45, and he literally got four wisps of a plant. It was, it was not even, like... We used to give people a handful of algae for, for nothing or for $5. You know, we'd say, or, you know, give me a contribution. That's fine. I'm going to buy fish food. And they'd hand you a 20. <laughs> You're like, wow. And for someone, so for a vendor to give you a few blades of grass and say, here you go. That's what we sell. I was shocked. I mean, seriously, I was just like, I can't believe that even happens. That's like someone selling Aptasia. I just, no. But anyway, um, I don't sell it because I don't sell livestock. I don't even grow it, so I can't even, like, help you out. But keep your ear open, and I'm sure that it'll start showing up elsewhere, and you'll be able to get some from somebody somewhere. Or maybe ask your fish store if they can bring it in. 
or ask them where they get it from. Uh, AD says, do you require a calcium reactor if you're doing water changes and dosing the tank? I'm kind of on the low side of calcium testing. Uh, no, you don't need a calcium reactor if you're able to dose the proper amount and keep up. And there are people out there with huge systems that have huge dosing systems rather than a calcium reactor, and that's the one that amazes me. Because the calcium reactor is really, once it's set up, it's kind of essentially set and forget it, and it's much easier, and it's more cost-effective, and it's a lot less labor than mixing up five, ten gallons of solution and making sure all your dosing pumps are dosing the right amount on a regular basis. But some people seem to live by it. Alex says, have you ever considered owning a freshwater tank with plants? Nope. Lincoln says, it's over skimming a thing. I put a hang on back Aquamax on a 29 gallon and I got dinos. Could that be related? No, I don't think so. I mean, dinos come from tanks that have dry sand and dry rock more than anything else I've seen. And uh, you may need some kind of a, a product to help clean up the tank, whether it's live rock enhance, Microbacter clean, some other type of bacteria, adding some live sand, but adding your skimmer on there is not going to create dinos. Berkey says, why isn't your girlfriend on the show more? Is she shy? Yep. <laughs> uh, Johan says, have you ever heard of Euphilia living outside the skeleton? My tank went through a crash, and all the Euphilia heads are still alive a month later. Um, I don't read. I don't know what the rest said, but I think they popped off, and so they're alive. If any heads come off of a LPS skeleton, they can, if they're you know in a little spot and you leave them alone, they can form a new calcium deposit and and create a new core and grow up from that. I had one head pop off of one of my hammer colonies, and it fell down low, and I just observed and it eventually grew larger and taller and then it had three heads and I'm like oh that's really cool so that can happen let's see how we doing on time hour and a half that's it should we do a four hour stream everyone I only said that because Caitlin's over here She's like, no. No, actually, I can't. I have to get some work done today. Uh, Sean says, how can I go about figuring out why and how emerald crabs don't survive in my system? I'm able to keep other invertebrates, but not those crabs. You could check your nitrates. You could also check and see what fish you have in that tank that may be eating the crabs. Because sometimes, like, for example, the yellow coarse wrasse I talked about would eat emerald crabs. So you put in the emerald seeds of bubble algae, and the wrasse eats the bulb, bubble algae eater, <laughs> and you can't win because the wrasse is always looking for a snack. That could be it. But no, if your uh, system, it could also be the vendor got some crabs that are in poor health, so you got them. And uh, it's just, you know, things can sometimes go wrong. You might try getting them somewhere else, just in case. Um, I remember buying quite a few and putting them in my tank and never saw them again. So it happens to all of us. Perky <clears throat> um, <clears throat> says, have you ever been to the aquarium in Springfield? M.O. Is that Missouri or Montana? <laughs> I always say, is it Missouri? Yeah, I don't think I've been to that one. Um, a lot of times you will see people with reef tanks that are much more beautiful than the public exhibits in these larger aquariums. And part of that has to do with the person at home has their one tank and they, they OCD it. They love on it so hard and it's gorgeous. And they post all their pictures and they make sure the pictures are perfect. Where a public aquarium has multiple displays and they have one or two or three employees working on all the tanks and things go wrong or th things get away from them or something happens you know and so we're like well why can't they have this amazing display you know why can't they do it like you know i don't know joe's got a twenty thousand gallon reef tank you guys have seen the video um it's a fantastic tank that is something like 20 years old now 
and it's his every single day job. That's his job. No one else works on that tank but him, and he works on it every single day. <clears throat> not one day goes by he's not working on it in some form or fashion, including hopping into the tank with scuba gear to polish the acrylic wall that got all scratched up from the fish hitting it with their scales, with their, their uh, little... What's that sharp thing on the, the cheek spine? Barbs. Yeah, and they use their barbs on their tails or their cheek spine, and they'll just flash the acrylic and scratch it all to hell. And he goes in there and polishes it until it's completely beautiful, crystal clear again. And he's had to do that many, many times. He probably does it a couple times a year. And that display is very hard to uh, compete with in other public aquariums. I've been to quite a few large aquariums, and Joe's tank was my favorite reef thus far. And I, you know, I've seen other you know places that had some nice ones in there, but Joe's was amazing to me. <laughs> it's it's just a really good thing. But he is few and far between. And you know what? He started off as a hobbyist, and the guy said to him, "Do you think you could build one bigger for a public aquarium?" And Joe said, "Sure." And he drew it out on a cocktail napkin, and that was twenty years ago. So it's really really neat. Uh, James says, I've been looking for the cobalt heaters and everyone is out. Do you know why? Do you sell them? Actually, I have some cobalt heaters in inventory. They're just the regular ones, not the neotherms. And I have several sizes in stock. So they're just not on the website like usual. So if you'll send me an email and tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can take care of that and get those out to you on Monday. They will go on the new website. <clears throat> Ethan says, could I add food coloring to my alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium just for looks and ease of identifying? Man, I would not do that. <laughs> I would much rather you buy a label maker and actually label them with words. Alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. And don't mix them up. And uh, no, I would not use food coloring. Uh, Glenn says, have you heard about any places that were banned last year from taking corals and fish that are going to be open again to be sold, like in Indonesia? I haven't heard anything about that in about six months. I think we've been too worried with the pandemic to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, everyone kind of shut down. I mean, we can't even travel to other countries currently. So the uh, the whole opening up coral sales and stuff, there was one opened up before COVID hit, and uh, I just stopped hearing about it. So I don't know. Hey, Jason says, Happy New Year to you, too. Me, too. So the shy girl, she smiled. <laughs> um, Steven says, I tried to feed my brain coral silver sides for the first time the other night. My two cleaner shrimps stole the chunks from its mouth. Any winning strategies for feeding? I have 27-inch tongs on the way. <laughs> okay, so if you want to feed the brain coral, the best method I've ever come up with uh, it wasn't my idea. I just, well, I don't think it was. I think, you know, I saw someone else do it first, or they did something. Just take the top of a two liter or three liter bottle and cut it off so that you have the cone part and drill a bunch of holes in it and then press that down over the coral so that it's got a dome of protection. And you can use your tongs or you can drop the silver side right in the neck and it'll land on the coral and give that coral plenty of time to eat. I mean, hours. Because I have had large corals like that on the, on the sand bed, and I would watch the food go completely into the mouth, and then, like you said, the clear shrimp comes over and puts its claw inside and just pulls the whole thing out and walks away. And I've tried feeding the shrimp first and then feed the coral, and that didn't work. They just dropped and came over to steal. It was super annoying. So the important thing about the dome that I'm telling you is that you've got to drill the holes, because when I was feeding sun corals, and I left the dome on there too long, by, like, say, for example, overnight, the coral would get very, very pale because the oxygen level plummeted inside the dome. So by putting holes, there's still, you know, I'm talking about quarter-inch holes. The shrimp can't get in there, the hermits can't get in there, nothing gets in there, but you could squirt mini mysis in there or whatever to feed the coral within, and the water moves through it, but the coral is left completely unpicked upon, and then let it really get the food and ingest it and, and digest it before you remove the dome. Set a timer or reminder or something so you don't forget. Um, especially if you're doing it late at night and you're you know, you're going to watch a movie now and then you're going to roll off to bed, you know, I would check on it, set the timer, timer goes off, take the dome off, go about your business. And if you feed that coral once or twice a week, you'll be fine. The uh, I think it'll work out well.
D say, says, do you really need a sump on a 75 gallon tank? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> but people have done it without. It's just more work. Um, the thing is, if let's say you have the 75 gallon tank with no sump, then you're gonna have to put the heaters in the tank, the power heads in the tank, the skimmer on the back, um, maybe a reactor on the back, you're gonna have tubes coming in, power heads going out, you got the light on top, it just becomes really distracting. You see all this gear and you can't really hide it. So it'd be better if you have the sump underneath where all this stuff goes and you just push water back up to the tank and the water drains down. Uh, ideally you want the tank to be drilled, so it's called a reef ready aquarium and that way it will just naturally through gravity drain down in the tank. Do I would not recommend some method of trying to start a siphon and then pump water up and try to time it because that doesn't work. And you can't pump water out and pump water in. That doesn't work either. It, the tank needs to have a hole in it <laughs> for water to go out and down. There are things out there called hang on back overflow boxes that you can add to the tank. And it basically is a box on the inside, a box on the outside, and then there's a U-tube that will suck the water over the wall, believe it or not, and down into the sump. And then you have a pump pushing water back up. And that's how I did my tanks early on in, you know, from 2000. I don't know, 2002 to 2004, something like that, maybe 2000 to 2004. But then I got reef ready tanks and I've never looked back. Those are usually tanks that have holes drilled in the back or in the bottom with an overflow box. The water drains over the overflow box into the holes and there's plumbing inside there to keep it quiet and it drains down. And you just push water up and it never can fail because it's pipes, it's permanent plumbing. There's not, it's not a siphon that can be broken. So that's why I recommend it. And like I said, having all that stuff in your tank just makes it ugly. I remember people would post pictures of their tank um, on the forum I was on and I would take their picture off the off the thread and I'd put it in Photoshop and I'd erase all the power heads and the thermometers and all the crap and I'd post the picture of their tank and say, hey, my tank looks so much better. <laughs> I said, yeah, I got rid of all that ugly stuff. And they're like, wow. <laughs> but in real life, you can't Photoshop it out. So it's better if you can put it somewhere where it's out of sight. Um, Alex says, why are most saltwater fish wild caught? Is that because they're hard to breed? There's been a lot of fish that have been successfully bred in the saltwater hobby. It's over 200 different species. <laughs> and, uh, but they're not all gorgeous. And like some of the fish people really like to buy aren't being bred yet. Like for example, I don't believe anyone has successfully bred the powder blue tang, which is really, really pretty. But they have bred yellow tangs, they have bred hippo tangs, um, and which are very popular in the hobby. They've bred all the clownfish to death. Uh, they've gotten lots and lots of gobies. If you go to ORA's website, Ocean Reef and Aquariums, ORA, they have a lot of fish on there. If you go to the January issue of Coral Magazine, they always have an article about, with a whole list of every fish that exists. But there are a lot of fish out there that are not being bred yet. Uh, maybe in the angelfish family. Um, I mean, wrasses. There's, there's quite a few that haven't people have to figure out how to do it. And once it's done, then it's a matter of, for example, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> My friend Matt Wittenrich years ago was the one to figure out how to raise mandarins from the eggs. And he was the first guy to do it. And he grew these itty bitty little tiny little mandarins. They were so small, they fit in a test tube. And we were at Macna holding up the test tube and we could see the little fish inside. It was insane. I was like, wow, I love it. And then later on, they said, well, these are going to cost you $80 because they're tank raised. I said, okay. And people were complaining that it was costing $80 and they'd rather pay $30 for the one taken from the ocean. There is a huge uh, problem with that mentality because, yes, you save money to take something from the ocean. But what you take from the ocean is a huge gamble of will it survive for a number of reasons that we talked about earlier. So maybe it will, maybe it won't. But the one that's tank raised lived in an aquarium, learned to eat the fish foods we offer or the foods it, at least we know what foods it got. And we can buy those foods with that fish and have success. So Biota is one of the companies that has uh, all kinds of tank raised fish, including the mandarins. And you can get those, you can get their food, you can get their tank. You can set up the whole thing and have a really nice little biotope. And uh, it would make so much more sense than hoping that the one that they got out of the ocean survives in your tank. Back in the day, we had to buy tank, I mean, ocean caught fish because that's what our options were. Some guy went out there and he scooped something out of the ocean and he sent it to a distributor. The distributor sent it to a fish store. Fish store put it in a bag and handed it to you and said, good luck. And, you know, we were like, oh, why didn't it work out? 
what did I do? <laughs> or what did that fish store do? And it's like it could go all the way back to how it was even caught. We don't know what happened at any point. So, uh, you know, we just, we, we should embrace more of the tank race fish. I know they cost more. It's not fun to pay more. But if it has a better chance of survival, if it's, let's just say it may even have a better immunity to fish disease too. Because again, it's tank rays, it's not coming from the ocean. So there's there's some good reasons to get those. And uh, I was really happy when ORA was releasing the mandarins. And they were selling for a while, and then people would complain. They're not eating the pellet food. That's what they said they'd eat. And they'd all complain. And ORA said, we're not going to make them anymore. It's not worth it. There's too many people complaining rather than just waiting for the fish to figure it out. <laughs> And I was like, that sucks. So I was really glad when Biota started doing it because now there's a source and uh, they'll tell you what food to get and you can just do it. And we have so many nice foods these days that pretty much anything we get, even the most finicky eaters, there's something out there that we actually have access to that we can feed and successfully keep that fish alive for a long time. Uh... Prune fingers, Reef. <laughs> Sounds like your hands in the tank much too long. Said, uh, what wrasses would be good choices for a 65-gallon bare bottom bottomless tank? Bare bottom tank, not bottomless. Uh, I know some wrasses need sand. I like the yellow coarse wrasse, but learned my lesson with those. The six lines are Satan's spawns, LOL. Um, the four line or the eight line are going to be much friendlier than the six line. There's something about six lines that just makes those fish mean. And the one I had, I called him Spike. He would put up all his little dorsal fins, and he just looked like a troublemaker. So I'd go for a four-line or a six-line. There is the McCorksky's wrasse. Doesn't live in the sand. Some wrasses, like the Christmas wrasse, go into the rock work and make a mucus bubble they sleep in at night to protect them, and then they burst out of the bubble every day. And later on in the day, you see the weird mucus blowing through your tank. Like, what was that? It came from your wrasse. So look for a wrasse that doesn't need to dwell in the sand. And see what shape you like, if you like the color of the style. There's lots of wrasses out there. I have a few on my Critter ID page if you want to look in the fish section just for some inspiration. But I don't have like 500 wrasses in there. And uh, so there's going to be a lot that is not in my list. You know, there, there might be six. Or, oh, the leopard wrasse is pretty. But I think that's a sand dweller. So, I mean, there's just certain wrasses do need sand. And you could put sand in the corner of the tank in a container of some kind if you can tolerate that. But, uh mm. I would just do a little more research. Top Secret Toy says, have you ever heard of captive bred flame angels? Yes, that's been done. And the Potter's Angels were captive bred. Uh, do you know of any other angels off the top of your head that have been bred? I'm asking you a question, yeah. Okay, she doesn't. Uh, there's probably a few others I've forgotten. Oh, yeah, the Bandit Angel. That was captive bred. Oh, yes, it was. Um... I feel like there's a few, but uh, hmm. <laughs> anyway, wait, wait, eventually there'll wait. be many. Uh, Center Podgy? No, the no, uh, no, no, the the deep down one. Not the peppermint. Yeah, not the peppermint. No. Um. Not the pyramid. No. <laughs> That's a butterfly. I don't know. Anyway, a few have been out there, but they usually cost more. Uh, Glenn, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Um, he says, Happy New Year, and a big thank you for all of last year. Well done, mate. <laughs> That's what he said to me. Uh, Joe says, What are your thoughts on Miracle Mud for the Refugium? I've never used it. And I've never seen a reef tank that made me want to use it. Usually I look at the reef tank, and it tells me, Oh, my God, you're using Miracle Mud? I need this. You know, but I just haven't. That's never happened. So I have seen a few nice tanks that had Miracle Mud, and I was happy for them. But it wasn't like... That's the missing ingredient for my tank, and if I add that, my life will change. It just never happened. So that's why I don't use it. Mason says, how long do you think you'll keep your metal halides? I'm thinking about ditching my black boxes and going back to the Hamilton metal halide and T5 fixture. Um, the LED fixtures, including the XHOs, which replaced my VHOs, made me really happy. I know some people like T5s because it fills in all the blank areas, so like you could do that, for example. But I wonder if you'd be happy with metal halide and XHOs like I did on my reef. I even have a radion with XHOs on the anemone cube that it got rid of all the dark spots. So I, I've been using metal halides forever. 
That being said, there is a light that I'm going, I'm going to probably try out here in the next couple of months. And if I like it, I will switch to it. But it's going to be really hard to impress me. <laughs> but I might do it. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Poma Labs is raising all kinds of crazy captive bread fish, including the conspiculatus angelfish, which comes from... Hawaii. It's Hawaii? I think so. Oh, I thought it was Australia. I thought it was like near Lord Harwensis. I thought that was their area. Anyway, um, these fish are beautiful coral eaters, and they get big, and they're like $5,000 for a little one. So you can get captive bred stuff. It's out there. It's just going to cost a lot. Um, but they have a bunch of different ones, including a bunch of hybrids. Like they'll have this fish that's like two different ones came together, and this one has like these weird blue scribbles on the side that would not normally be on that fish. And uh, people are buying them up left and right. They think they're really cool. Just like the clownfish. There's so many kinds of clownfish. Everyone wants another type out there rather than just going with a regular true percula. So, yeah, the conspects are beautiful, and I wouldn't, I would not mind having one of those, but that's an expensive fish to buy. Every participant research and development of more fish. Every fish that's purchased fuels research and development of more fish. So Poma Labs is a website. It's run by the same guy, Matt Wittenrich, right? That I was talking about for the mandarins. Mm -hmm. And uh, he showed his he showed off his little baby angels. They were so small at Macna a couple of years ago. Actually, for a few years in a row. I remember when I was at the Louisiana Macna, he had a tank full of them. We we're all like, what am I looking at? I couldn't believe it. I just sat there with my phone filming, 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 because they're so pretty and so adorable. I love tiny things. You guys know that. So anyway, uh, there's more and more on the way, and some things will always be outside of our price range, and other things will become more affordable as more people are doing it. But we're lucky to have some people out there spearheading the captive breeding of these many fish that come from the oceans. So we don't deplete what's in our oceans, which I think is great. All right, guys, that was it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I want to uh, remind you, please test your water today because water tests save lives. That line came from Caitlin, and it's a great line. <laughs> we, need, we need a t-shirt that says that for Saturday. Um, and you want to test everything. Alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, salinity, temperature, pH. Know them all. Find out what they are. And keep testing every week, week after week. And if you need to do it more frequently, do it more frequently. If you don't have all those kits, buy them. If you need them, Mila's Reef sells them. I have this awesome little link right here. There you go. Milosreef.com sells Elos test kits and salad for test kits. And we have the Smart Spin, which I told you guys about. And people are buying it. They're like, wow, this thing is amazing. The Smart Spin is a $30 device that charges with a USB cord and then holds it. I haven't charged it since I plugged it in. I mean, I've tested and tested and tested, and it hasn't turned red yet. So I haven't had to plug it in the wall yet. And that was like a month ago. And you can do your tests quickly without shaking a beaker with your hand like this. It's so nice. It's easy to read the color. Um, I've used it with API tests. I've used it with ELOS tests. I've used it with Salifer tests. It just, the beaker size has to be the Red Sea beaker or smaller. The Salifer beaker square doesn't fit that thing. But it comes with a little tiny bead. It's dead silent. You can do your test rapidly. You can get through all your tests in less than 20 minutes. And so you need to get it. <laughs> And I ship that Smartster, if that's the only thing you need, I ship it for $6. So if you want to buy that from the website, and my website charges you FedEx rates, you'll be getting a, a refund of the difference. So, you know, don't feel like, oh, shipping's so high, I can't afford that, because I never try to take advantage of you guys when it comes to shipping. And uh, Caitlin is helping process orders and helping box things up. There's a teamwork happening over here these days. So uh, we do appreciate the business that you provide, because it feeds Spock and keeps her healthy and happy. And we get a little food, too, so that's useful as well. I hope you guys have a great week, and I will see you again next weekend at 2 o'clock Central Time. It's really 2.08 Central Time. And uh, if in the meantime, if you want to hang out, come to Club Neil's Reef. We have a very nice group there full of nice, friendly people that love to talk all things reef. We don't allow people to be made fun of or belittled or trolled, and we just delete those people forever. So, you know, if you're a friendly person and you want to find more friendly people, we've got them all in one spot for you. Guys, have a great weekend.